Um, what we will do today is talk about some concrete ways that uh, uh, we have come up with as a kind of conference green team, uh, Reverend uh, Mel Carraway and others uh, have helped kind of put together a set of resources that a couple of you may be familiar with already, just having been in, in some of those conversations, uh, and a couple of new ones that uh, may really be helpful for us to touch base about uh, that we've discovered uh, in the meantime. Um, so I'm really excited about talking about some concrete ways uh, to think about climate change through the, the lens of faith and a, a robust Wesleyan um, model of discipleship, uh, knowing that we, um, uh, you know, like the early Methodists, um, are a part of a faith that uh, engages the world in a really robust way, um, thinking about how faith uh, compels us to be engaged in our communities, especially around um, where there's hurting in the world. We think of the early uh, Wesleyan movement, John Wesley and his early um, uh, pastors and, and lay leaders getting started uh, in some of the uh, poor parts of England, uh, connecting with those that were displaced um, during the Industrial Revolution and facing uh, a lot of uh, social change um, and disruption of economic and social ways of being in their world, um, and uh, you know, frankly, uh, ecological disruptions uh, with the advent of coal plants and um, coal mining and uh, disruptions that, that were brought about by the Industrial Revolution for better and worse. Um, and so we know that we are in good company uh, with the saints uh, and the great cloud of witnesses that have come before us. I would like to share my screen with you now and offer us a prayer that uh, Mel Carraway uh, discovered as a part of a, um, uh, a reflection, a set of reflections and devotional that uh, was created ahead of uh, COP26, of course, this global gathering of leaders wrestling with how we can, um, as the world's kind of biggest economies and, um, and those that are most affected on the ground by climate change can, can make some real uh, commitments and ways to follow through with those commitments to prevent the worst effects of climate change, right? So that's COP26 that um, a lot of it has already happened uh, here this month, uh, but there are a few more days left. And so we wanna be able to pray for them and pray for our, uh, our country and others in following through with our commitments. Um, so if you will allow me to uh, read these words on, on my end and uh, on your end, I invite you to uh, pray these words where you are. Holy God, all things live and move and have their being in you. You create day and night, sky, earth and sea. You make earth to bring forth plants yielding seed and trees bearing fruit. You set the sun and moon and the stars in their orbits and let them measure the passage of time. Out of the dust of the ground you formed us, and every bird of the air and animal of the field, creatures of unfathomable beauty and variety. You make us in your image with power and responsibility to fulfill the good in all the great web of life. Guide us and those in deliberation in Glasgow today to carry out our responsibilities and exercise our power to support all your good creation. Amen. So there are a number of ways that um, we wanted to talk about uh, ways that we have already found uh, to respond as disciples of Jesus Christ. So these are things that people are already doing. Um, these are things that are at hand. 
uh, people we know are doing them. And so we want to be able to lift those up to us and make sure we know that there are things that, um, that we are already doing and can join in the work uh, and even kind of leverage. So some examples here locally uh, on renewable energy use and production. So Casa Emanuel uh, United Methodist here in Dallas um, has install already installed solar panels. Um, I'm I'm connecting with them to see kind of what their experience has been as a faith community um, and working out what, what electricity costs are uh, and kind of all those details to see what that, what that might mean. Um, first, Mesquite here in uh, the Metro District uh, worked with Texas, um, actually Mesquite Master Gardeners to basically replant their the front of their church um, with all native plants, uh, with volunteers from the community, worked with the city of Mesquite to um, greet, uh, install these huge cisterns that were donated by the city to collect uh, rainwater to then feed those, um, those plants in that native garden. Uh, Christ UMC Plano, where we sometimes have our annual conference, uh, invested in xeriscaping in a lot of areas uh, because of a concern for, uh, for the earth. And uh, one of their building additions is actually uh, a LEED certified building because that was important to them. Uh, in, in East Dallas, we have the Owenwood Farm and Neighbor Space, uh, which um, has installed pollinator plots. They partnered with the National Resources Conservation Service uh, which provides grants to install these uh, plots of land that um, are all native plants that uh, provide kind of a safe harbor for bees and butterflies. Of course, the monarchs have been uh, coming through North Texas in the last few, um, few weeks, and so that helps them. Um, next year, uh, it's believed the monarchs are going to be designated an endangered species uh, of sorts, and so uh, there will be opportunities to be able to help in in new ways to, to help them in their migration. Um, emergency center uh, power backup. So they have been working with their city councilors to try and take advantage of uh, uh, American Rescue Plan funds that the federal government uh, gave to the county and city to create uh, uh, warming and cooling shelters in the event of emergencies like last February. Uh, and we know that um, climate change means that many of the weather events um, that we find most harmful, uh, like last February in the winter storm, uh, will probably get worse in terms of intensity and uh, the frequency. And so um, they're looking to actually install uh, backup systems to power uh, their physical plants. So it's going to keep their pipes from bursting. It's going to make sure neighbors, uh, especially those that are vulnerable, are warm or kept cool. Um, and they may even be able to put uh, some solar panels uh, and batteries, invest in some renewable energy. Um, that's kind of an ongoing project that they're working on. Um, we as a conference, so some of your churches purchase electricity through a kind of pooled um, aggregate energy plan uh, that um, the main allure is that it is a very cheap energy plan, uh, but at least 20% of that is renewable, which is about what is uh, normal across the, uh, the state of Texas. And uh, I believe individual churches can actually um, move that number up and what they um, are investing in, wanting to invest in. And that may increase their, their price, but th those are things that individual churches um, you know, discerning what they can do uh, might be able to avail themselves of. Uh, Interfaith Power and Light is an a interfaith organization nationally that works on climate justice and uh, ways that congregations can respond. So they've created what's called coolcongregations.org. And it has lots of ideas and in, in, in fact, a checklist of ways that uh, 
you can work through as a congregation uh, easy ways to, to not only save money, but try to save uh, the environment and, and fight the worst effects of climate change. You know, climate change is happening, will continue to happen. And the question is, I think for many, um, how can we prevent the worst effects uh, of climate change and keep it uh, at, a, at a threshold that uh, is less destructive? Um, so those are include energy audits. So some congregations have already done this, but there are companies um, out there that come in and help do energy audits to see kind of where money can be saved in, uh, in your campus. Um, and for some, especially when we have older buildings, that just means having a programmable thermostat. Um, that's something a lot of people inve have invested in. <clears throat> and they have lots of suggestions for how to, how to go about doing these things. Within our United Methodist Church, uh, we have Earth Keepers training uh, to train individuals on uh, ways that they can kind of be activated in their community and in church to do some of this very work and so we've got links here for that um, and all of this is going to be sent to you uh, after our uh, workshop today uh, united methodist creation justice movement uh, so umc creation umc um creation justice.org uh, is another kind of element of our uh, church that is uh, convening work around this area so well, there are people already doing some of this work um, and people that are, are like-minded and like-hearted. And of course, our United Methodist Women uh, have a number of uh, studies that they have conducted in the last couple of years, Bible studies and <clears throat> devotionals uh, that have really worked around climate uh, change and Solar energy is, I think, something that's an ongoing conversation within United Methodist circles, United Methodist women circles. Um, and so uh, on their website, they actually have a number of, of free uh, devotionals and ways that people can get engaged that won't be totally unfamiliar to a lot of our churches. Um, and we have uh, folks around the the connection our united methodist annual conferences that are trying to help equip other conferences to kind of grow their impact and ability to lead in issues around climate change so uh this this month so on the first there was a call about you know why is this important why is this our mission uh, let's talk about a, a theology and a, cre a creation um, and why we are here um, and the next session is coming up around, you know, let's think about our contexts, um, given, you know, our, our various mission settings. So Dallas and uh, North Texas and, and as a state, and uh, then they're going to talk about, you know, how to recruit and, um, and think about uh, kind of building those things out. So if you're interested in um, kind of helping spark some of this work, not only in your setting, but um, across North Texas, uh, there's a place for you. And uh, we would love to have your help um, uh, thinking through some ways we can do that. Because we know that um, for some of us around North Texas, there's going to be a way in which, uh, you know, different people have different skills. Uh, so let me see if Tracy may be with us. Let's see here. So I don't see her today. Um, but Tracy uh, Wallace, who's a, a member at Greenland Hills, I believe, uh, has a, a, a nonprofit where she uh, works to uh, train those who are coming out of um, the criminal justice system, those who are having a difficult time finding employment. And gets them trained for doing solar installations uh, to help kind of in this new green economy and find a way to get to gain, have gainful employment, meaningful employment. And uh, they refer um, those um, trainees to reputable companies that treat their workers well. 
And so, um, you know, different people have, uh, oh, thank you, greencareersdallas.org. Thank you, Carrie. Um, and so uh, uh, there's also a need for, you know, helping think through what some good policies for, um, you know, building new buildings might be around our own land use. Um, when we think about uh, as a conference, there there are um, committees that you have to go through if you're if you're wanting to have a building project. So, you know, are there questions that we need to ask about uh, about those projects to make sure that they're um, not lead certified uh, necessarily, but you know, things that are are doable. Uh, and then also just help with the advocacy efforts and helping us uh, broaden the conversation. Um, because if we're to make a difference as, uh, as people of faith, it has to be providing a vision for hope and giving some really practical ways that we can um, um, make a difference. Because when we start talking about um, climate change, uh, it brings up so much anxiety, right? For, for many of us, um, especially, um, you know, many young people, millennials, uh, generation um, uh, feel so much anxiety and a sense of doom and gloom that um, it can be at some points paralyzing. And so it's uh, for us, those of us who believe in uh, resurrection in, um, grace that defies even the cross uh, to think about uh, ways that we can give for folks to be able to, um, to make a difference and add not just about um, not using a straw. In fact, you know, this kind of sense of personal guilt is, um, is that's kind of put on us kind of socially to make a difference um, is in one part, good and okay, but in other parts, it's for these bigger structures of, of international companies, of nations like ours to be able to collectively be held accountable to make uh, good choices for the betterment of, of all of us as a people around the globe. That's where the real uh, difference gets made. So we, um, in two previous meetings, had some conversation around what we might be able to do um, and what God is kind of calling us to do around the conference. So we talked about speakers groups moving around uh, to different churches that, uh, that have an interest, that don't quite know where to get started. Uh, churches have had a Bible study during Lent. Um, Gracie, is that your church? Yeah. Uh, so Gracie's on the call from Rockwall First Methodist, and they have a, a creation care uh, study that they've had. I'm sure they'd be willing to share uh, some of their resources. Um, how can we lift up voices of youth that um, perhaps are, are really concerned and, and want to voice their, um, their hopes and dreams for how we might address these things? You know, talking about community gardening and farming, um, working with um, a lot of our churches are more and more interested in agriculture and looking at how we can use our space to actually grow food um, and think about how to uh, share food together. <coughs> Excuse me. There are ways that um, oh, we might be able to actually direct funds uh, toward helping uh, some of the efforts around the conference. <coughs> Excuse me. A little bit of a cough this week. So uh, one item that, uh, let's see, just making sure Tracy, uh, seeing if she was on because she's our, our resident expert in this. One thing that we're in conversation about with uh, our Center for Connectional Ministries, which of course is the, the money and the insurance and the, the, the legal uh, matters here as a conference, and, uh, and are talking about with uh, the leaders of this organization. It's called PACE, and it's called it's a property assessed clean energy program. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have to get a, a cough drop to make it through the sermon. 
Um, so as you know, even though we're nonprofits, our properties are assessed at a certain um, value by our, our different taxing agencies locally. And this is a federally backed and organized program that each state um, and, and in some cases, some cases counties end up managing. And what it does is incentivizes uh, property owners to make upgrades in their facilities with little or no uh, kind of upfront capital. Um, and what it, it effectively does is allows a nonprofit or company to borrow uh, for a long-term um, low interest loan uh, up to 20% of you know, the value of a loan that's already out on the building, which many of our, our newer churches can already have loans to, to help with, uh, or 25% of uh, a property's assessed value if the, the loans are paid off uh, to make improvements like solar panels uh, and um, new roofs, weatherization to lower the utility bills. So uh, one example is uh, Congregational Congregation Beth Israel in Austin. Um, they needed uh, a new HVAC system in a big way. So they financed $460,000 of HVAC systems and uh, energy savings. So you're talking about insulation, weatherization, new lighting systems like <clears throat> that are upgrades that save uh, on utility bills um, that allowed them to not have these outages uh, because they had a uh, uh, day school. And so that was disrupting their ability to be in ministry, uh, not to mention Sunday mornings. Um, and so they have these new mechanical systems that resulted in this 9,000 kilowatt hour reduction um, immediately. And so utility savings annually of about 15,000. Um, so, you know, these can be used on mechanical system modernization, um, working on new roofs, new windows, high efficiency chillers, boilers and furnaces, wastewater reuse, um, you know, high efficiency lighting, uh, water conservation equipment, you know, think of those cisterns to capture rainwater to, to help your uh, physical plant. And these are kind of some numbers that they're looking at. And, and you know, I'm not uh, in a place yet where I can say this is necessarily a good idea, but it's one that we're exploring that might make some of our, um, our different ministry settings around the conference, um, you know, be able to kind of make, make it uh, really financially in, in the years to come and be able you to make mentioned, some You mentioned um, lead certification and... Uh, oh, Christine, you're, um, you muted yourself. I, you mentioned lead certification and PACE has been there around for a while. And they kind of, the thing that holds people back from making a lot of efficiency changes is the upfront cost. And so PACE addresses that and um, regarding uh, LEED certified buildings that the city of Dallas has um, constructed or renovated, uh, they say that the, build, the changes pay for themselves. Mm -hmm. It's the upfront cost that needs to be uh, handled, and that's what PACE is for. Right. So, there, so there's some settings where this really makes sense and others, um, others not so much. Um, so I'd be interested to know, you know, for your particular um, uh, setting, the things that you're, you know, doing right now individually and and some of you are, are in leadership in different um, ministries and churches. Um, what is most exciting for you? Where do you find yourself drawn 
right now. And if you just say your name and, and perhaps what um, yeah, my, where you are my, as a congregation. Yeah, my name is Glenn, and, and I'm working with uh, Citizen Climate Lobby. Have you heard of that? I've heard of it, but could you describe it for us? Okay, it's a, I see Christine shaking her head. I think she's familiar with it, but uh, it's a, it's a nonprofit, non-political organization that's pushing the idea of fee and dividend. Uh, and the reason why I'm quite interested in it is I see a lot of young people in it too as well, which is exciting, a rather diverse group with a lot of young people because they're the ones that are gonna be most impacted. But uh, I'm trying to work on presentations to inform people about the issues of climate change, which a lot of people, there's so much misinformation out there that we have to try to present stuff that people believe in, which I usually use credible sources like NASA and stuff like that. But uh, that's kind of where I'm focusing on now. Uh, and I like what CCL, Citizen Climate Lobby, is proposing, which is basically a fee and dividend approach to on carbon, fee on carbon, and then everybody gets a dividend back, an equal dividend, to encourage people to uh, reduce their emissions. And Catherine Hayhoe, I'm sure you all have heard of her, she commented that uh, about a third of it roughly is uh, what we can do as individuals, but the other two thirds is a systemic problem that we have. So we've got to change the system uh, and that's why I think what they're driving at is that systemic problem. I think that's important. Mm. And of course, it, that doesn't say we can't do things individually. I mean, it, it, you know, there's more, this is a pretty complex issue. So there's a lot of different things we can do. But, but that's kind of where my focus is. I'm trying to do, work on a presentation uh, for church groups. I've talked to uh, some down at First Methodist, and I'm working with CCL to try to tune that presentation to get it to work. Thank you, Glenn. Others, where are you finding your energy drawn around climate climate change? And it's also okay to just not feel any any energy right now. Um, I um. Last Sunday uh, led the discussion of the first part of the film that I told you about, um, the ants and the grasshopper, uh, in a Sunday school at uh, Christ Lutheran. And it was very well received. The people were really excited about uh, seeing the rest of the film. It's a three week uh, study. Um, and, um, it's, um, it's a way in which climate change can be related to, um, many of our other callings as a church, uh, our ministry and our concern for others, uh, in a, uh, a way that is more visible uh, and more accessible than our um, uh, hearing statistics about uh, tons of carbon. Mm -hmm. uh, Christine, are you available to um, conduct that kind of discussion at other churches? Yes, um, but they don't need me. Um, okay. The um, Study guide is uh, available online at the Anson, Anson the Grasshopper documentary.org. I'm not sure what the name of the, the website is. Okay. I will look that up and uh, get that to us. Others. What's um, what prompted uh, y'all to join this call today? Uh, for me, just information as to what's going on um, and what activities there are. Um, just general knowledge. 
I didn't realize you all get 20% of your energy from renewable energy, so that's a, a plus that I could put in. Mm. Yeah, I'll kind of say the same thing. At our church, there's a few people who are interested in um, like climate change. And so just hearing some more information about what's going on and what other churches are doing that we could possibly do. Hey. Oh, great. Andy has shared with us the uh, link for uh, the ants in the grasshopper film. I'm going out on a limb here. I hope this is the one Chris was talking about. <laughs> Internet at your own peril. Any others? So general information, um, seeing what other churches are doing. Um, so moving ahead, so um, Mel Carraway, uh, who is a retired uh, clergy person, uh, but in many senses not retired at all, uh, is actually in Glasgow uh, right now. And it's been a part of the, uh, the conversations happening there at COP26. And um, when he is available, once he returns, um, is, has volunteered to kind of go over what happened, where some of the conversations are, um, and kind of what we can do on the ground. Um, would that be of interest to you uh, to hear more about what, what what his experience was and kind of where we are. Yeah. It's funny you said that I actually just emailed Mel today asking if he would join our church and society group next Thursday to talk about, to give an update. So okay. maybe we can kill two birds with one, or uh, feed two birds with one scone. Let's do, yeah. <laughs> Let's do that then. I'll introduce myself. I'm Elizabeth McCormick, and I'm a missionary, but work as a mission advocate for Global Ministries, our mission agency for our United Methodist Church, and um, connected with Mel recently and, um, and was on a recent, in a recent conversation with the um, Creation Justice Network. And so, and you mentioned Earth Keepers earlier through Global Ministries. And so if it's okay with you, I'll put the links to both of those in the chat. Um, but on this most recent call, we talked about, um, well, you talked about it just now about advocacy within our own congregations, within our own networks. And I think that's so important because some of us have kind of, you know, let this slip to the wayside. Um, but we need to be very vigilant about this and sharing it in our networks, um, in our communities, um, and in our Sunday mornings. We are, you know, this is the creation that we live in. God made it and we get to take care of it. So just to be a voice for that. Uh, so I'll throw some links up in the chat that you guys may already know about, but may find them helpful. So. That would be really uh, helpful, Elizabeth. And, and what I'll do is copy them out of the chat and send them um, with some follow-up notes afterward. Um, and a couple of things that uh, may be of interest. Um, so I've picked up a couple of uh, books. Uh, one is called the, the Church of the Wild by Victoria Lures. Um, some of you may be interested in this. Um, she started uh, with others a um, uh, basically a wild church network. And so they uh, have spaces that are um, outdoors in a lot of circumstances um, and think about how, how um, especially given the, the time of climate change and um, needing to build our resilience and, and really begin more advocacy, uh, how we can have 
faith experiences outside that really engage those things because many of our um, church experiences are really kind of divorced from nature. Um, and, you know, I don't know about y'all, but the experiences that I've had either going on retreats um, uh, or just kind of being out in nature really kind of open up uh, our souls to be able to experience God and, um, and, and Christ in new ways. Um, and so that's one of the things I'm reading and interested in right now. So, uh, Phil, I uh, know you're in and out right now, but we'll connect about uh, the call maybe next Thursday. Is that right, Phil? Um, I will send that to yeah, everyone. Yeah, that's correct. Right. At noon. Yep. At noon. Um, I can send that information, Phil, to our group um, once you get that um, call put together. And so you'll have that and can share that as well. Is there anything else that um, that you would like to kind of share in terms of any resources or ideas that we haven't named already? Things that you're interested in? Okay. Well, um, I want to thank you for your time today. Uh, we'll set up this call with uh, with Mel. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and I will put in, let me put in my email address in case there's other, um, information that you want to send our way for others. And, uh, we will, uh, kind of reconvene a little ways out, um, for any updates we might have, because we want to keep the energy uh, going, uh, around this issue. All right. Um, Gracie, would you lead us in a prayer to pray us out? Sure. God, we thank you for this space and we just admire your creation and the fact that you have given it to us as a gift and something to take care of. Um, God, we help us to be faithful in that in that pursuit and help us to lead others in that pursuit. Um, we ask you to guide us and lead us and be with us. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Thanks, y'all. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you.